Hello, and welcome to this CUBE conversation. I'm Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the CUBE Research. And today I am joined by Jeb Nadiner, who's the Senior Vice President of Government Relations with Govini, a software company that leverages AI and commercial data to help solve defense acquisitions at defense acquisition challenges at scale. Jeb, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Well, absolutely. So today, our conversation is going to center on the role of commercial AI and enabled software in data in helping to solve defense acquisition challenges. Jeb, you have got one heck of an impressive background. I'm, I'm just going to hit the highlights here, but you've spent a couple of decades. You've got a couple of decades of expertise in defense and commercial um, industrial bases, deep expertise in supply chain initiatives. You've got a long history of work in the government and public affairs sectors. You've served as the Senior Vice President of SAFE, directing bipartisan initiatives to incentivize U.S. and allied nations' use of high-tech supply chains for autos, semiconductors, critical minerals, and strategic minerals. You've served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Policy, Senior VP of Govern Government Affairs for GINSA. Director of the USMC Krulak Center of Innovation at Quantico. And you've been a VP of Technology and uh, Engineering at Lockheed Martin. I mean, seriously, Jeb, what haven't you done? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I've, I've uh, tried to do my part uh, since American uh, industry and manufacturing is not all it needs to be. So I haven't done that good a job uh, so far, but uh, there is a future. Well, I would guess that um, there are many people along your career journey who would probably argue that you've done a great job. And speaking of career journeys, I, I always ask my guests on this show to just share with me something, something interesting, um, something about your career journey, maybe how it started or maybe something unusual or just something that, you know, might not be something that other people would know. Lay it on us. Well, uh, I was uh, working at Lockheed Martin on uh, defense supply chains and some large programs. And in the process, I was struck by just how thin the bottom of the pyramid of the supply chain base was. And this was for the F-35. And in so many cases, there was one to three suppliers left. And sometimes it was one supplier. I'd find out that... Uh, the suppliers are in their, the couple's in their 70s, and they plan on closing shop, uh, which I was sort of shocked by it. Uh, so I had a conversation with uh, former Secretary of State and Treasury, George Schultz. He had also been the, the uh, dean of the Booth School at Chicago. And he said, you got to write about this. Uh, so that began my journey uh, into really thinking deeply about uh, American manufacturing, American supply chains, in particular, how we make and we how we acquire military systems. Well, I think that, you know, you and I chatted a little bit about this before we jumped on to this recording. And I think that, you know, supply chain used to be a topic that ordinary average people really weren't thinking very much about. Today, um, I think having the experience, the collective experience of navigating a global pandemic has changed that. And I think people are much more aware of supply chain and the role that supply chain plays in all of our lives. And of course, as it relates to government procurement and that sort of thing, it's even it's even bigger part of the equation. Um, one of the things I know we're going to talk about today is just really, so we've got some supply chain challenges that we're going to discuss, and, and we're also going to discuss how AI, um, interjecting AI into this equation can help make the U.S. government acquisition process more productive, um, you know, more people involved in this process, more knowledgeable, and, and actually help protect us against disruption. I think that, um, you know, using AI for national security it, uh, acquisitions can have a huge impact at scale. And, and but, you know, I think this, for me, this is key because a lot of times when we think, and I'm talking about ordinary average humans thinking about government, thinking about government, thinking about uh, military, and thinking about supply chain. And a lot of the stories that we hear from a procurement standpoint are that, you know, things are 
poorly managed or, you know, like you pointed out, there might not be enough suppliers or um, things are, processes are not efficient or we're not tracking things and things can, you know, budgets can quickly go off the rails and things like that. So I think that, you know, kind of inspiring trust in the government, being able to cost effectively handle procurement issues is a big thing here. And I think that it's something that all Americans are interested in. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, the government is one of the big, biggest purchasers of products and services yeah. in the U.S. economy. And uh, unfortunately, and I think, you, you know, government personnel are frustrated by the process. American citizens are frustrated. Congress is frustrated. Uh, because a lot of the systems that they use to do this kind of purchasing, uh, it's very antiquated. Yeah. And the commercial sector in the U.S. and globally has skipped a few generations uh, compared to the government. Yeah. And the result is that, particularly in defense acquisition programs, uh, whether it's shipbuilding or airplane production, the uh, the timelines for acquisitions keep getting longer and the output keeps getting less, which is the exact opposite of almost everything else in the economy. Almost everything else in the economy, if you look over a 40-year period, yeah. it's double, triple the production in a fraction of the time. Yeah, so it's a lot to do with the underlying systems. Yeah, and that's what we want, and that's what we need. You know, quicker production of vital weapons, more effective maintenance, better sustainability, um, you know, being able to more effectively harness our existing industrial base, all of these things. And, and you know, I mean, this is no small topic because this is actually how the United States stays competitive in in the global environment. And, and um, you know, I mean, we're obviously a world power and we have certain responsibilities that go along with that. So I'm really interested in talking more. And I know this is, you know, where you live is, you know, kind of thinking about how AI enabled acquisition um, helps solve for these challenges. So do you want to share a little bit of thinking on that front? Sure. Well, uh, government acquisitions suffer from a few problems. It's a, first of all, it's a unique system. It's not like the way we buy things on Amazon. It's heavily governed by, you know, thousands and thousands of pages of law. Uh, yeah. But having said that, uh, the government is inevitably in the acquisition system either has not enough data or too much data. And one of the ways you get the data and one of the ways you get ahead of that, uh, if you have a data deluge, is through the computer. And that's the function of AI. And that that's really a game changer. Right. Um, so, for example, we as a company, we have purpose-built, uh, coming out of the commercial sector, software for the defense acquisition system. And then we've got one of the largest collections of parts data in the world. And then we have a huge amount of data on companies, a huge amount of data on people that are involved in the acquisition system. And then add to that shipping data and insurance data. Uh, so we can tell so sometimes when a part leaves Shenzhen, China, enters Long Beach, and then enters Dayton, Ohio, and enters the defense supply chain. And that can be done all within a, you know, in the speed of electrons. So that's a game changer. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I want to spend a little bit of time on, and I'm kind of ping-ponging back here, um, one of the things I want to spend a little time on, at, you know, before we dive really deeply into these challenges, I want to talk a little bit about Gavini. And you shared with me earlier a little bit about how you were introduced to Gavini, so I'll ask you to share that with us. But but I know that, you know, I had a terrific interview with Tara Murphy Doherty, who's the CEO of Gavini, a couple months ago. And this was, Gavini was just about ready to host its second annual Defense, defense Tech Conference, the Defense Software and Data Summit. Um, you had speakers from all over the world, from Shield AI, from Palantir, from Anduril and Intel, leaders from the federal government. Um, I know that was an amazing event. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to be there. Do you have a couple of highlights that you could share with us about this event? And, you know, I know your goal was to bring together people who are working to solve for these challenges, vendors and government officials. I'd love to hear just some insights from the event? I think one of the themes of the event was how can software change this big defense acquisition enterprise? In a, cer a certain sense, you've got, you've got the industry that you've got. Uh, it's not going to change immediately. 
Uh, it's got some strengths, it's got some weaknesses. You have a government that operates under certain laws, but the software can be replaced. The software can be changed. And I think the commonality of the companies we're talking about, Govini, Palantir, Shield AI, they're all companies that start with the software first. Right. And the software enables you to mobilize data. In some cases, it's data for military missions. In other cases, like for our, for, in our, you know, for our system, it's data for the acquisition process. And there was a great, I think there was great hunger. Like we had a lot of uniform personnel from the Defense Department, and uh, none of them are happy with the pace of how acquisitions are done. Yeah. Uh, they all like change now. Just a few years ago, 10, 15 years ago, you did not have this defense tech sector that was interested in an institution like the Defense Department. You even had some companies where you had employees saying, we will not work on a contract that involves the Defense Department. Yeah. Today, it's completely different. In 2024, uh, a lot of America's brightest technologists want to work on federal government problems. They want to work on the Defense Department. And they want to work on it in, from all different angles, all the way from acquisitions and procurement to you know, how do we uh, defeat if we have to go to war an adversary and how to best yet, how do we deter an enemy? Well, and I think that, you know, technology companies like Govini and others play kind of an outsized role in contributing to national security and, you know, in supporting and protecting the government in ways that I don't think get enough recognition probably. So one, of, I think one of the things we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to free up government personnel to actually focus on the most important questions and sort of the things that for them are like mundane data, entering things in spreadsheets. All of that can be automated today with an app, just like we use on our iPhone. And hence, then you could have a few hundred thousand people working on the tasks that the computer can't do, the tasks that AI can't, AI can't do. Um, but instead, today, I think too much of their time is taken up on things that in the commercial sector are done largely by the machine. Right. So what makes Govini unique in this particular space? Uh, lots of companies working on AI, lots of companies working on AI in the government. Govini is the only company that has purpose-built software and data for the defense acquisition process. So this many hundreds of billions of dollars, nearly trillion dollar process, this is the only software and data that's purpose built for that system. That's kind of not a bad place to be for Govini. Yeah, we've had a <laughs> I, we also had, we've had a fair amount of success in a yeah. relatively short time. Currently, uh, our software is used to manage one hundred forty billion dollars of defense acquisitions, um, but there's still a trillion to go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, you know, I also see that, you know, I mean, we've got some very real challenges. We look at China and the inroads that China is making in the AI space. And, you know, I mean, we've got nation state threat actors from China and other places continually focusing on U.S. government critical infrastructure, that sort of thing. So, you know, it it seems like going deep on this is in the government's best interests. Yeah, we're we're in a we're in a tremendous competition yeah. with China. I mean, look at the size of their economy. Look at the large number of talented people there. Look at the tech ecosystem there. Look at the amount that they steal from us and then make it quicker than we could. Yeah. Um, so this well, is sort of the race of our this is the race of our generation. Yeah, well, and I think that, you know, my experience with the Chinese is that, you know, they are uh, patient, strategic, very invested in long games as it relates to 
cybersecurity initiatives, any any kinds of things like that. But you know, I don't know that there's anything more important to the Chinese government today than AI and you know their quest to win the AI wars, right? And that comes with that that presents significant challenges to the United States and other companies. They're also digitizing a lot of their supply chain, how they manage them. And that 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 will reverberate for the good of their defense acquisitions. Yeah. So it's really important for us to do the same. Well, and that leads me to my next discussion point. I wanted to talk a little bit about building a bridge between public and private sector. And, and as we both know, of course, that can be difficult. And there can often be a disconnect between the government and the rest of the world. And what do we need to change to bridge that gap? How's China doing it better than we are? Well, the government, uh, U.S. government in many ways is several decades behind the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. It just needs to adopt a lot of the best commercial practices. Well, let me give you an example. Um, financial services was really changed by Bloomberg and the Bloomberg Terminal. So Bloomberg's proposition 30, 35 years ago was if you, Goldman Sachs, want to know about a company you're thinking about underwriting, whether you should or not, how should you value it? You can wait for the company to give you lots of data, and then you can try and interpret it. Or with a few keystrokes on my terminal, you can figure out 98% of the company, what it's like really quickly. And this predominated, it's spread through financial services. It's gone, you know, Amazon's a great example, employs uh, this kind of technology in, uh, in a, a, every day on its platform. But the government, the federal government, has not really adopted it yet. And most of its IT tends to be bespoke. It tends to be made by the same handful of sort of well-known names, you know, good companies, right? but they're not at the leading edge of technology or AI. And what's happening today is this new defense tech community, which we are, you know, a foundational member of, we are beginning to bring in and discrete, discrete uh, elements of the defense acquisition process. And the rest of the government was saying, okay, here is a process you can revolutionize. Here you can change it. You can change the way you buy things. You can know your supply chains. You don't have to wait till all the parts run out in the warehouse. You can actually have an indicator that goes off six months before saying, time to buy again. Right. You know, talking about this makes me think about uh, a personal situation. I have twin high school seniors heading to college in the fall. And um, speaking of government entities, um, you know, there's the FAFSA form that is generally speaking a requirement to fill out for the part of the college admissions process. And the U.S. government decided to completely revamp the, the application or the, you know, the forms and the process and everything else and rolled that out sometime earlier this year. And it was late to roll out. It has the, the there've been all kinds of technological issues and problems with the form. Um, in many instances, parents all over the country are trying to make a decision about where to send their kids to college and figure out what they can afford and what they're going to need to borrow and everything else. And we're really just hamstrung by the government's lack of efficient handling of this process. And it reminds me about, um, you know, the, the phrase good enough for government work, which I think used to be a test for the best, right? Best in class. If it's good enough for the government, it's good enough for everyone. The bar is so high here. Um, and I, you know, my hope is that we, is that embracing technology, embracing SaaS solutions, embracing um, you know supply chain uh, supply chain solutions like what Govini has, kind of will be the beginning of leading us back into the reality that the government does should have a high bar, and if if you're working with the government or if something, you know, good enough for government work needs to come back to a respected term, I think. Yeah, you know, in the days when only the government could put a man on the moon, okay, so right. government technology was the best. Yeah. semiconductor industry largely comes out of government-inspired initiatives yeah. in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. But that changed over time. And 
often government personnel are saddled with really poor systems. They may yeah. be yesterday, but the technology dates back 40 years ago. There's an yeah. like we've discovered, you know, with our data, there's an incredible amount of 40 year old semiconductor technology in U.S. defense systems. Uh, it's uh, so it doesn't have doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned FAFSA. Uh, I looked through it this year too. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations. <with> our, <laughs> uh, and have survived. But let's take something like the Defense Travel Service. So in the last year, the Defense Department had a multi-year effort to create a system by which employees could travel on official business around the country to get their tickets and their lodging. Okay. Fortune was poured into the system. Uh, and the system was ultimately canceled. Now, it begs the question, why would the government, why would the Defense Department ever build its own travel system? The rest of us use Kayak, Expedia, TripAdvisor. The government could have easily said, okay, we've got a few extra laws that govern travel. Uh, we've got you know, our own unique per diems. They could have gone to a set of these companies and said, okay, you've got best-in-class technology hundreds of millions of Americans, and if not, maybe perhaps even a couple billion people around the world use these systems. Right. We need a little bit of configuring for our special uses. And they would just pay a license. But instead, they started from scratch. And not necessarily with the kind of talent that an Expedia has to build its system. Yeah. So the same thing has, the there's the same lesson applies into numerous areas. Uh, the best and the brightest in technology are going to develop their own products. They're going to do it without uh, government support, but they're going to be willing to sell to the government. Right. Those are going to be the cutting edge solutions. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So let's shift a little bit and talk about AI and how AI can be used to help the government improve its ability to develop and, and purchase the things it needs to run smoothly. And, and, you know, in the defense acquisition world, this is where Govini is squarely focused. So talk with me a little bit about the role that AI will play here. So AI will, instead of having to parse through a supply chain, and look at tens of thousands of parts and try and figure out what's in a system, let's say an airplane or an artillery shell. With AI uh, and our software and our parts data, that is done automatically. We've got 60 people that sit in Pittsburgh and they just do data science and computer engineering all day. And they bring together all kinds of data. Some of it's scraped off the web. Some of it comes from specialized sources. And the magic really happens when it's brought together. Uh, and that data then, that's where the AI is. That's the artificial intelligence. So instead of, let's say, 100 people in a military program executive office working on a weapon system, instead of 100 people having blueprints all around, looking at contracts, right. instead, they can look into their computer and there'll be an app that tells them, okay, these are the parts that we're short on. These are the new technologies we want to introduce. Here's the way we're going to qualify them. Here's the costs. Here's how I can compete it. Oh, um, these key suppliers sit in a flood zone. So I better I better worry about that. And around that, yeah. This supplier has been really good for six years, but there's some financial indicators indicating they're taking on too much debt. So maybe it's time to get some additional suppliers. All of that can be done in seconds. Yeah. Well, you know, it seems to me that the federal government has the exact same challenge that every other business has today. And that is, you know, more data than we know what to do with and the challenge of, of getting our arms around that. And, you know, sometimes that data lives in different offices in different parts of the world. It's in spreadsheets. <laughs> It's in post-it notes, you know, it's all over the place and it's not standardized, it's not linked, it's not normalized. So it sounds to me like what it is that Govini solves for is taking all of that disparate data, putting it into one place and then providing access across the board to the people who need it to be able to make the, to be able to have, get insights from the data and to be able to use those insights to make strategic decisions. Sound right? Yes. So it's to make the data usable. Yeah. And 
So instead of a decision taking six months or six years, can you make it in two days? And that you can do because the data has been brought together. Yeah, that that makes that makes a well, lot of for sense. For example, in something as co an entity as complex as the Defense Department, it has an Army, an Air Force, a Navy, a Space Force. And in the Navy, there is a shipbuilding command and there's a submarine command that builds submarines. And I could go on and on. So frequently, they're cannibalizing the same supply chain. So it's essentially fratricide. So the beauty of the beauty of software and commercial data is you can get a holistic picture and you can see, oh, the submarine folks, they're using the same supplier as we are. So maybe we need to have a conversation on how to deconflict, or maybe we need yeah. here's some alternative supplier. There's three other three other suppliers that can do this as well, too. Yeah. That currently can't be done in when everyone's in a separate office, a separate separate stovepipe. So what does Govini's arc have to do in this process? I mean, what the what role does it play? So the software is called the arc, as okay. in the arc of knowledge. Um, and very similar to the Bloomberg terminal of years ago, yeah. you can look to it and you have the data that you need and the data in a form that you need with applications for your particular workflows. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And I think that my notes show that you manage over $140 billion worth of defense acquisition programs in ARC. That's not a small number. No, it's $140 billion of defense acquisitions. Uh, it's grown very quickly. Uh, so, and the product has been very sticky in the sense that once people use it, it's hard for them to imagine uh, going back to a world where they didn't use it. Um, yeah. but the defense department's a big place. Defense acquisitions are large. And yeah. there's, there's, more, there's more space for us to go into. Well, yeah. And, you know, I, I remember hearing something about the Department of Health and Human Services and, and they're using ARC as well and, and using that to refresh supplier data on, I don't know, 200 plus vendors. And all of this is really about reducing time spent on due diligence, which isn't necessarily a military acquisition, but it's really an important part of government services offered to the public. Yeah. So the ARC is useful for other departments too. So we have yeah. work in Health and Human Services, Department yeah. of Homeland Security, uh, parts of the intelligence community. Uh, for example, Health and Human Services, as we learned during COVID, they buy a lot of medical supplies. They buy critical infrastructure. Uh, they buy software that runs on that critical infrastructure. All of that needs to be vetted to make sure it's not coming from someplace that we can't rely on. And with the ARC, they can do this all automatically and quickly. Yeah. So, and I think that I remember that Govini's ARC platform can also help identify areas of risk. And I'm specifically thinking about, you know, uh, dis discovering that more than 40% of the DOD's weapon systems and platforms use semiconductors with China embedded in supply chains. That could be problematic. Yeah. So one of the things that we discovered with the ARC was something that uh, quite a few people in the DOD suspected that a lot of the semiconductors used, semiconductors burn out after a while. They have to be replaced. Yeah. yeah. A lot of the replacement semiconductors in DOD weapon systems and critical infrastructure, they originate out of China because these tend to be older nodes, large, largely not that profitable to make in the US, and they've been outsourced to China. So one of the things we've discovered is that uh, 40% of uh, those supply chains have deep Chinese supply connections. Uh, so that's a risk. There's other kinds of risk too. There's environmental risk, there's compliance risk, there's financial risk. All of these things need to be automated with AI. So you don't have to parse and do multi-month investigations on just one facet of it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's talk a minute about where you think, I mean, obviously there's so many use cases for for AI. Where do you see today and in the immediate future AI having the most impact? 
I think the biggest impact for AI in the Defense Department um, is not necessarily war fighting and operations. I think the biggest single impact is to alleviate the shortage of equipment. Yeah. With AI and something like the ARC, we can increase production, increase speed, and we can reverse these trends that have led to an ever smaller U.S. force. And it's very obvious today with Ukraine and Taiwan and Israel that we need a lot more production. We can't afford the inefficiencies. We can't afford what uh, Abraham Lincoln called the slows. Yeah. Can't afford the cost growth because the defense budget is nearly a trillion dollars. So we've got to make we've got to make well with the budget that we have, and that means being able to produce at a speed and cost effectiveness that we used to do in the 1950s and 60s. You know, and and one of the things I focus a lot in the cybersecurity space, and one of the things that I find incredibly attractive about about AI in general, about Govini's Arc solution in particular, is being able to use AI to help identify risks more rapidly. It's kind of like that identification of the semiconductors coming from China. I mean, part of it is really just having all of your data in one place so it's accessible, it's usable, and that sort of thing. But um, but understanding where those risks are more quickly protects everybody, you know? No, definitely. Um, it levels the playing field also, because right now, I think the Defense Department has a very, since it doesn't have that many analytic capabilities, uh, and its people are very stretched, it has a huge dependency on a few large defense contractors for the data. And really, the reality is that um, Defense Department officials, they need to do oversight in the performance of the contracts to make sure that the taxpayer is actually getting what they paid for. So to have a capability like the ARC levels that playing field. Suddenly, they, they don't have to just rely on the contractor. They can say, wait a second, I see the supply chain disruption here. Or to me, the costs are actually there. So that that is uh, that's a very significant shift. Yeah, and yeah, we need absolutely. to encourage that across the board. You know, I absolutely agree. Um, one of the things that I one of the kind of uh, use case examples that came across my field of vision that I thought was particularly interesting was you know the risks in battery supply chains, and you know I think anybody from a personal standpoint, from a professional standpoint, must acknowledge that batteries play an important role in all of our lives, right? So share with us a little bit about what you were able to discover about battery supply chains and really where, where you were able to identify a problem. So I, um, I, got, a, I got a query from uh, Congress's US-China Economic Commission uh, for testimony, and particularly on batteries. Um, and batteries are really important. It's not just electric vehicles. You can be pro-electric vehicle. You can not care. Batteries, are, batteries aren't batteries everything. There yeah. is no military system that doesn't have batteries. And there's very few aspects of social function that don't depend on batteries. And that's been the case for a long time. Yeah. One of the things that we did a quick query in the ARC, we were able to see, okay, uh, there are a lot of battery factories going up in the U.S., and that's been well publicized. However, the underlying supplies that enable those factories to operate, the battery materials, the cathodes, the anodes, yeah. the electrolytes, most of them, the vast majority of them, come from China. Even when we're importing a Korean or Japanese battery, a huge amount of those underlying materials come from China. So what does that mean? That means that if there's a trade stoppage with China, or there's a conflict, that means that our battery factories are going to stop production because they're just not going to have the underlying chemicals and materials to make yeah. batteries. Just kind of like what happened when that that ship, the cargo ship, the Ever Given was stuck and we were just waiting for access to all of the things that we needed to power our lives. So, you know, can't, we can't really afford to uh, sit by and let that happen without solving for that, right? Yeah, the uh, a ship stops in the Suez Canal, turns the wrong way, and blocks <laughs> the canal. 
Uh, suddenly, a lot of other ships can't get through. Yeah. So that underscores the point that um, some of our customers are using the ARC for, which is uh, they want to reduce they want to reduce U.S. dependency on China. That means okay, perhaps uh, some things will be made in Thailand, and some things will be made in Mexico, and some things made in in Greece. But the idea is to distribute your supply chain risk, uh, so you're not so vulnerable from a single point of failure. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a smart business strategy, no matter what you do, right? Uh, you know, you you touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to talk a little bit now about, you know, what, explore kind of what prevents the government from, you know, a mad dash to adopt AI. And I know the answer to some of this and, that, you know, there's uncertainty around AI across the board. And I understand that. Um, I know that in some instances, as it related to government work, there was at one time a, a challenge of employee willingness. You touched on that a little bit. Um, you know, there's also, I think, the the impression that the government procurement process is just legendary for being arduous and tremendously difficult to navigate. And so from a vendor standpoint, from a supplier standpoint, sometimes that could be, um, you know, a challenge. But, um, and, and like I said, you spoke a little bit to employee willingness. And I think now we're at a time where that isn't so much of an issue. But what do you, how do you see um, us getting through those roadblocks? Or are we already through them? Uh, we have a long way to go. Um... The process is very complicated. Multiple books of the U.S. Code govern government acquisitions and procurements. Um, some of them were, many of those laws were built for a different age. However, um, I would say the Congress over the last 30 years has made a lot of changes. Uh, they've opened up the market. They really wanted commercial companies to come in. There's something called the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act. One Senator John Glenn pushed that through. It's about to have its third decade, a uh, 30-year anniversary. It is little of aid, even though it's uh, the law that Congress passed, and it requires using commercial off-the-shelf technology. Senator Glenn, who was one of those senators that really understood technology, had been to the moon uh, twice, I mean, twice in space and once to the moon, um, he saw where technology had changed, that the government was no longer necessarily the leader in all areas, right. and said, okay, in many cases, I don't want someone in the Defense Department or Health and Human Services trying to build their own version of the technology when something first class and cutting edge already exists in the commercial sector at a fraction of the cost. So I think in many ways, the authorities exist for quicker federal acquisitions of new technologies. The problem is the status quo. I think there's a lot of incentives in the federal workforce for going with old solutions, which seem to be uh, low risk. It's been done before. The paperwork's been already completed. Uh, supervisor seems to know those older ways, older technologies. However, the result is pretty unimpressive. Right. So uh, I think there's, there's beginnings of a vanguard in places like the Department of Defense to, to use newer technologies for these so-called administrative processes like acquisitions and procurement. And that's something we need to encourage. And I think we need to follow you know, the law as uh, Senator Glenn uh, pushed through Congress. You know, well, I, I certainly won't disagree. And one of the things I know that has been challenging, again, having to do with the reputation of the government for being somewhat slow, the procurement process is being arduous and that sort of thing. I mean, I've heard stories about, you know, uh, an, a government office identifying a need, getting funding, approving funding, uh, identifying a vendor that they want to work with. And then just it takes so long for those funds to be dispersed that sometimes, sometimes some of those potential vendors just go belly up. I mean, here you were um, excited because you were expecting, you know, to be able to work and fulfill, a, you know, couple hundred million dollar project or whatever. And because the government moves so slowly, then, you know, it could have dire circumstances or dire um, consequences. But I feel like some of what you're saying, Jeb, is that it, is some of the government awareness shifting a little bit? Is there an awareness around, 
you know, if, if we don't step it up here, if we don't learn to move more quickly, to be able to identify the best and brightest in terms of technology vendors and technology solutions and that sort of thing, um, we're going to be in a world of trouble. Do you think there's some kind of mindset on the part of the government in, in that direction at all? I think there is, especially with the Ukraine crisis, the Israel crisis, and most of all, the China uh, problem. Yeah. I think people want to move quicker. Um, the trend lines have not been good, uh, despite all the talk about supporting small business in America. Um, <laughs> the numbers of small businesses uh, selling to the government, particularly the Defense Department, keeps going down year by yeah. year. Uh, we've been losing them. Uh, we've been fortunate. Uh, we're a relatively small business, uh, but we've been very successful in getting a number of contracts. And the beauty of the contracts that we have with the Defense Department is that the defense customer that wants to act quickly, they can they can get on contract and get our software as a service within days. That's a little bit unusual. We need to make that the norm in the Defense yeah. Department. Yeah. Well, and I look at, you know, um, I look at... And we've talked about this here quite a lot too. You know, we've got a new generation, a couple of generations moving into the workforce, um, moving into decision making positions and things like that. And people for whom, you know, in some instances are digital natives and understand how, you know, the important role that technology plays and that sort of thing. So I'm thinking that, you know, a combination of that that skill set and experience and expectation and then you know the reality of being able to solve for supply chain and procurement issues and that really being you know a, a very important part of our success here overall as a government as a country that sort of thing i mean i feel like i feel like there's a bright future ahead maybe yeah, i'm just I, not maybe i'm an optimist <laughs> i think that people i think the people entering the government they are digital natives yeah, it's a speed. Uh, they they're used to speed in every aspect of their lives yeah. when they deal with technology. So they don't want uh, they don't want old systems. Uh, they don't want to have to wait ten years for a refresh. They want the refresh every night, if not yeah. several an hour. <laughs> uh, so those are positive factors. I can say, particularly in the Defense Department, on the uniform side, where they bear such heavy responsibilities, um, they. Uh, you know, speed is their mantra, yeah. and they want it. And that's, well, that's, an, that's an important constituency for us. Yeah, well, I I would, I can see why. You know, I'll never forget one of my daughters, uh, one of my daughters a decade ago, uh, graduated from college, worked for a couple of years. It, we're, we live in Kansas City, Missouri, and she went to the University of Kansas, and then she got a job in Chicago working for a gigantic PR firm. And I will never forget her sending me a photo on her first day at work of the computer that was on her desk that had to be like 15 years old. And she was like, Mom, I can't believe <laughs> this is my computer. And and my response to her was, oh, honey, you know, it'll be all right. Surely the laptop that you have will be much more, um, much more of a, a later model. And she's like, mom, I don't get a laptop. I have to earn, I have to, you know, earn that with my seniority. And But my point is, and we laughed about it, but she was evaluating her decision to take that job based upon the, you know, dated equipment that she was expected to use on a daily basis. And I can promise you, if, if she would have known that before accepting that job offer, it might have given her pause. And I think that, you know, some of some of the conversations that I see and, you know, since all of our conversations today are, are about AI in some form or another, right? But some of the conversations I see when people are trying to hire um, AI talent, you know, the first question is, well, how many GPUs do you have? <laughs> Because if you yeah. can't, if you don't have what I need to do, what it is I love doing and what it is I know I'm really great at, I'm going to pass. Yeah, people entering the workforce, um, particularly in defense, what they want is they want they want great they want great technologies, they want great problems, they want yeah. great people to work with. If one of those things is missing, uh, it's going to be off. Yeah. Well, and they know that they don't have to stick around. You know. I mean, the demand is high for highly skilled talent. So, 
it, it'll be it'll be very interesting to watch this evolve for sure. So Jeb, as we wrap the show, it's clear that we're moving out of the information era and into a new era fueled by technology and AI. And, you know, of course, the role that AI is playing and, and will play moving forward is significant and will continue to increase in significance, I think. What do you see here is the biggest opportunity for the Department of Defense and the and the federal government here? I think the Department of Defense, to use uh, military terminology, is sort of a kill chain from the start of what you need to do till you hit the target. Right now, the only way the only way to move that kill chain faster is with data and software, electrons. And they can really change the kill chain, not just in terms of uh, warfare, but they can do it in terms of how they buy equipment and how quickly they can develop it and get it fielded. And that's the most exciting thing, I think, that we're working on in Govini. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Well, you know, our government used to be the leader in emerging technologies, and I would guess that I am not alone in wanting to see us earn that status again, and AI is the way that we're going to make that happen, right, Jeb? Very much so. <laughs> Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, as I knew it would be. Jeb Nadanir, Senior Vice President of Government Relations with Govini, thank you so much for spending time with me today. And I look forward to touching base with you again in coming months and just kind of keeping track of what's happening with Govini. I'm sure it'll be exciting. Thank you, Shelley.